uh, we are really excited uh, to have the opportunity to present this panel on education to promote the ESGs and SDGs for human security. We will be focusing on how education in business economics, but also generally in social and human sciences, humanities, can enhance support for human security and how the ESGs and SDG frameworks can help in doing so um, through the very well-specified framework that has been developed around these uh, acronyms that I'm gonna define very, very quickly here. Um, so I understand that you can see my slides and um, the, um, the panelists will be uh, talking from different angles, uh, from uh, social uh, and economic sciences, from uh, the anthropology uh, spectrum, uh, from information technology spectrum, they will be trying to integrate how education in the sustainable development goals can enhance human security. And I think this is very important uh, because the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, UN Agenda 2030 is our only common vision together with the Charter of uh, Human Rights of the UN. It's our only common vision. And it is quite instrumental to understand how and if, if and how it embraces human security. I lead this Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation in Euphoria, uh, which includes five research institutions, uh, five different innovation accelerators, and is connected very vividly with uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, which is a global network of about 1,800 institutional members focusing on facilitating the implementation of the SDGs. So uh, the, the speakers in these sessions are in, in different ways affiliated with the Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation, and they are renowned uh, scientists in their uh, fields. So the big crucial question is how are we going to transition ourselves from the multi-crisis uh, towards sustainability, towards the SDGs, towards the 17 sustainable development goals, which basically integrate uh, all aspects of interplay between the society, nature, and the economy. We want to face pandemics, economic recession, inflationary pressures, climate change, biodiversity collapse, uh, geopolitical insecurity, energy prices, food insecurity, population growth, increasing inequality. And we have to face them all in a very... Um, efficient, but also simultaneous way. Is that at all possible? And we have to simultaneously face all this crisis because no one can be put on a pathway of sustainability if it can solve only one of these crises. The crises are interconnected and they should only be uh, faced in a very integrated systemic framework. What I'm gonna be arguing in this um, session and in my very brief introduction is that um, human security is fully integrated in the Sustainable Development Goals Framework. And in order to be able to identify solutions, technological, financial, 
policy solutions for uh, implementing human security goals within the sustainable development goals, you need to have a very sharp framework in which you can measure the SDGs in terms of the performance of each and every nation, region, um, a town, municipality, company, institution, you need to be able to measure the implementation performance of all these different units that make up our socioeconomic framework. As we know, human security encompasses uh, human rights, good governance, access to education, healthcare, and it aims at securing that each individual has opportunities and choices to fulfill his or her potential. If there is a criticism about um, the framework of uh, human security, or the framework in which the concept of human security is uh, analyzed and goes into implementable uh, goals and targets, is that it lacks the necessary clarity and precision in terms of within goals in order to constitute a meaningful con a concept amenable to measuring and policy targeting. So for me, in order to transpose wishes and vision into implementation, you need to have clarity in terms of where you want to go, where you are today, and what are the means of reaching your future vision together with a very explicit framework of measuring, assessing, and monitoring the progress. Human security has aspects of economic security, food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, political security. And of course, there are various reports that deal with these different aspects and try to uh, develop indexes and measurements for uh, the different aspects of the security. And here I showcase just a few of these uh, re reports the Global Risk Report, Ecological Threat Report, Google Security and Nutrition Report, Project State Index, Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, Peace Index, and of course the Human Development Report of, um, of the UN, which uh, transposes into um, an index, a human development index, that can measure the level of development at different uh, places across the world. As I said before, the UN Agenda 2030, because it's a very holistic, integrated and inclusive agenda, that was the aim of this agenda, to be integrated, holistic, inclusive, and at the same time, be explicit enough to easily transpose into investment programs and implementation policies. The UN Agenda 2030, uh, 2030 at, at least for us, is inherently related to human security. And uh, human security becomes an analytical and programming tool that complements and enriches uh, mechanisms to achieve the SDGs. Actually, uh, the Millennium Development Goals and the human security aspects make up the SDGs. So mapping human security reports into SDGs allows us to uh, screen the different aspects of human security into the SDGs 
and measure the level of the implementation of these uh, aspects in all countries of the world also go subnational in within countries and even within companies, uh, financial institutions, and so on, municipalities, cities, and so on. So we, we did an exercise and the report is available from the website of the World Academy of Art and Science that actually transposes the indexes of the different reports that measure human security aspects into SDG content. And when we are talking about the SDGs, we're not just talking about 70 um, KPIs. We are talking about 169 targets within the 17 SDGs and 200 and almost 50 KPIs that allow us to measure as accurately as possible. And the accuracy is refined as we continue researching and, uh, and analyzing um this area of uh or, or this discipline so what we did is to transpose the aspects of human security as measured by various indices in a number of these uh, different reports and transpose this index into sdg content this is important because uh, the performance of each and every country with regards to the SDGs is measured every year since the launch of the SDGs 2015 in the Sustainable Development Report that we uh, publish every year as United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network that measures for each country the 17 SDGs, the 169 uh, targets implementation level using more than uh, 200 KPIs. And it is this measurement that allows us to know where we are and where we want to go and give us the opportunity to scientifically develop the pathways, the optimal mixture of policies and technologies and finances that will produce the solutions that will get us from where we are now to where we want to go in 2030. As economists, uh, we do a lot of relevant work. However, I want to before showcase some of the work and maybe I will do it after my co-speakers uh, come in and give their own ideas. But the good news for me is that the, although the progress with regards to SDGs has been slowed down, has been reverted in 2021 and 2022 during the pandemic, and we know that there is a huge funding gap for, for the SDGs to be implemented of about 10 to 14 trillion US dollars across the world. We need to see a lot of significant progress in terms of policy implementation. I just uh, put two maps, uh, the uh, world map with regards to pledges for net zero, where net zero has been achieved and when it has been promised as the final output by given deadlines. And here we have a variation between 2030 and 2070, but at least we have this unprecedented um, frequency of pledges. And in places like Europe, for example, we have a very detailed policy net, uh, um, framework that really incentivizes and provides the means, methods, and solutions and the financial instruments 
and also the financial in incentives and awareness and investments in education in order to really implement the target. And we have the same for the digital transition. This is the content with regards to digital transition in terms of human capital, connectivity, integration of digital technology, digital public services in Europe, but also across the globe. So the green and digital transition has started. It needs to be empowered. And of course, in order to empower transitions, you need the technology, but the technology is the outcome of research, and research is the outcome of education. You need the policies, but the correct mixture of policies is based on really deep knowledge of the existing situation, but also a mixture of expertise is needed in terms of uh, economics, social aspects, technological aspects, and so on, in order to design the right policies. And of course, this has a very um, vivid and hard education element. And above all, in order to really engage in um, the transition and achieve the engagement of all the stakeholders in this transition, not just the scientists, not just the technology developers, not just the policy makers, but also the politicians, the civil society, the general public, you really need to educate them that the problems are there, they should understand the problems, they should understand the solutions exist, they should be given the opportunity to be educated in using the solutions and be upskilled and reskilled in order to be a real part, a real um, participant in this transition. And of course, all this awareness building, upskilling and reskilling is part of education. And if we want to go back to the basics, we also need to go to all the grades of our education system, the uh, pr primary, secondary education, university education, and understand what is the cutting edge technologies that we need to know about, but most of all, how this interdisciplinary systemic frameworks are gonna be the frameworks in which we shape our lives. So we need to stop working uh, within the silos of individual disciplines and individual institutions and start being uh, educated in interdisciplinary understanding, interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary technological outcomes. I will stop here and we'll come back with some of the work that we do on ESGs and SDGs education for companies and for uh, professionals, but also students. And I would uh, like to uh, give the floor uh, to our next speaker. Um, I, I would like to ask uh, Pavlos uh, Gavuras uh, to come in. He's an anthropologist. Um, he does exciting work. Uh, he's now a professor at uh, the National and Kabbalistian University of Athens. We work closely and I'm very proud of that. And at the same time, he's a UNESCO chair. He will introduce the uh, different hats that he wears. Uh, Pablo, please. Thank you, Phoebe. And um, thanks for inviting me to this wonderful uh, panel. And it's an opportunity also for me uh, to um, discuss issues of my expertise um, alongside with uh, people who have different uh, um, experiences and, uh, and um, knowledge. 
So as an anthropologist, as you said, uh, <clears throat> it seems to me that both acronyms, ESG and uh, SDG, um, we all know that they stand for the environment, the society, governance, and the SDGs are something like 17 of them, covering many aspects of uh, social and uh, cultural life, and not only social and cultural life. Um, so the first one, ESG, is a rating system, whereas the SDGs is um, they, uh, they, they refer to global goals concerning humanity set by the UN. What interests me in this regard is that all of these issues, all of these concepts are uh, bread and butter for anthropologists. That is, we deal with all of them in different sectors of anthropology. There is an accumulated knowledge in all the areas like environmental anthropology, social anthropology, political anthropology, economic anthropology, with the journals and conferences and the like. Why am I saying this? Because I think that in discussions of this kind, uh, it would be interesting to have, like you have done, an anthropologist uh, in your group talking about ESGs and SDGs. But although anthropologists provide knowledge that is always derived from a meticulous study of particular societies and in specific time space uh, uh, contexts, I would say, I would ask the rhetorical question, is anthropology enough? Even the anthropology that brings in difference, different views of the world, actually lived and experienced in empirical ways that are very difficult to be measured? I would say, I would rush to say, no, it is necessary, but not a sufficient um, approach to studying or understanding humanity, namely the anthropological approach as we know it. Recently, fairly recently, physical anthropology, which is the anthropology which studies human beings as physical entities, as biological entities, uh, has told us that we, modern humans, are the descendants of a subspecies that uh, is called Homo sapiens sapiens. Why is this important? Because the double sapiens there uh, introduces a capacity uh, in this uh, species to reflect over reflecting, to experience over experiencing, to be conscious of his, her own consciousness. You understand that this capacity is very important and it's the fundamental biological, anthropological um, quality that has allowed humanity to have choice. And choice is important because choice, you mentioned Phoebe before about the freedom from want and the freedom from fear being the fundamental aspects of human security. Yes, freedom, freedom is a quintessential aspect of uh, a, any humanistic approach. But freedom, in what sense? There has to be choice towards freedom. If you deprive humanity from choice, then there is no freedom at all. It's only instinct and it's only um, a predetermined stance in life. So this choice has given us the ability to self-reflect. Self-reflexivity is very important for humanity. Why? Because we have this tendency to um, focus on our activities, emotions, uh, rationalities, 
memories, whatever constitutes us as human beings from the point of view of a dominating ego consciousness. Don't think that this is, um, this is only an aspect uh, interesting to anthropologists, psychologists, and uh, uh, similar scientists, because it dominates, it saturates our everyday life. All the SDGs could be approached from a such uh, viewpoint, namely the viewpoint of self-reflexivity, the viewpoint of, uh, of choice, the viewpoint, if you like, of ego awareness. Why is this important? Because with ego comes this fundamental urge and quality to survive. Why survival is very important when we are talking about security? Because around the issue of survival, egos, that is individuals, that is societies, that is conglomerates of societies, uh, nations, countries, they, uh, they stick together, they organize in order to promote their interests. Companies, they do so also. They are saturated by the interest to make money and maximize their profits. So there is ego behind everything we do. We need to understand, therefore, that humanity, in order to pursue its, um, uh, its well-being and, uh, and facilitate its well-being, uh, humanity has to work with what we call human intelligence. Human intelligence cannot be reduced to reason and rationalizing. It cannot be reduced to memory, although both of these uh, dimensions are important, very important. It has to develop human intelligence in order to, in order to uh, appear, appear emerge in its full sense, it has to appear as self-awareness. It has to appear as consciousness of consciousness, of economic consciousness, of political consciousness, a meta-consciousness, if you like. We cannot have successful implementation of SDGs unless we establish a new approach of coping with consciousness about the specific particular consciousnesses as expressed by the SDGs. So um, I would say, and I will close here, that in my areas of expertise, which is the arts, music and the performing arts, culture in various uh, aspects, and education, of course, being a professor at the university, I have explored the different ways, not of an towards an interdisciplinary approach, but towards a transdisciplinary perspective, meaning that uh, what interests me is not only the stitching together, if you like, exploring the epistemology of how to cope with different methodologies, that's what uh, interdisciplinary agents do, but to focus on a new tool, a new framework, a higher aspect of intelligence that implies our learning, our, if you like, uh, opening to the capacity of, of, of reflecting on our reflections. This is not a mere philosophical stochastic uh, endeavor. This is an approach in my view that could contribute greatly to promoting uh, well-being, the well-being of humanity. And uh, it is in this sense that I see a contribution of a humanistic approach, an anthropological approach to panels or to groups like the, like the ones that you are, um, that you are heading and, and working with uh, Phoebe, and um, contribute towards moving from performances of otherness, which usually they hide 
Ines, Igones, we always talk about others in a sense, hiding, you know, um, masquerading even our interests and intentions. So move from the performance of otherness to othering performance itself. By othering here, I mean, Ines should come to the fore. You should teach our, our students. We should uh, talk about these issues to people who are, who are open and could be enlightened with a new paradigm of thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pavlos. It's always such a pleasure listening to you. You said we need human intelligence. The reason and memory is not enough. Self-awareness is needed and should be defined, should be in our minds as a meta-consciousness with the different aspects of self-consciousness and other consciousness that we need to integrate. And I, I truly um, understand what you are um, uh, what you are promoting here, uh, given that uh, my my team works also works in um, experimental um, experimental economics and sociology, and we also work with uh, neuroscientists. And it seems that the the classic paradigm of economics of the rational agent. Uh, it, it, it is not the relevant one in many cases, and especially in cases that are quite realistic, that integrate uh, uncertainty and ambiguity. So we need uh, to come to terms as economists with the fact that uh, human beings are something much more than reason and memory. And uh, what uh, the anthropologists have to offer in this, together with the psychologists, I think is uh, very valuable. And, and without that, we cannot really engage the, 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 the society as a whole, the economy and the society as a whole into SDGs, understanding and implementation. So it, it, it's really crucial to bring all these elements into our design of um, instruments, policies, investment plans, education, and social support in order to achieve the SDGs. Thank, thank you very much uh, for your very interesting intervention. What is your UNESCO chair? Can you please repeat your UNESCO chair? Yeah, the, it is titled Anthropology of Traditional Music, Holland, Representing and Repositioning Intangible Cultural Heritage. The intangible is always the, the most interesting part of all the elements and for us economists as well. Trying we are, to we are also kind of we are also kind of dropping the term intangible for living heritage because for instance music is usually qualified as intangible, but it has tangible aspects also. Aspects. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's the same for economic uh, services and goods. Some of their elements are tangible and some others are completely intangible and outside market. So it's very intriguing. Um, the next speaker is also a very good friend, a very, very close collaborator. Somebody that we all need in terms of the discipline he represents. Uh, he is the president of uh, the World uh, Machinery a a Association, which is uh, uh, the global scientific association of information technology, um, of the information technology professionals and scientists. He can define that more accurately uh, when I give him the floor. 
uh, Professor Yanis Ioannidis is um, a professor at the National and Kabbalistic University of Athens, has a long career in uh, U.S. Um, uh, top-ranked institutions. He has been leading the main information technology research center of uh, Greece for 10 years, and I'm really honored to have him with us. Yanni. Thank you very much, uh, Phoebe, for this uh, introduction and also for inviting me to, to share a few thoughts. Uh, as, as Phoebe said, uh, I'm not an economist like she is, and I'm not an anthropologist like Pavlos is. I bring in the, the square things, the, 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 the hardest, the, the, the harder, um, uh, the boring things, digital. I, I bring the digital aspect in all this. And um, if I look at the, try to connect the issues of, of my discipline with the issues of security and so on, um, I, I think that the more my discipline advances technology, uh, Although there are more opportunities to, to advance society and feel more secure, uh, in principle, many more dangers pop up. If, if, we, if we look at the uh, 17 SDGs, uh, first of all, uh, uh, as, as uh, you may know, uh, the, the UNSDSN has defined six transformations uh, for uh, the SDGs, group them in, in various uh, clusters. And the sixth cluster is a digital transformation. And that's the only one that is, a, is connected to every single one of the 17 SDGs. So nothing can be done without uh, uh, guys like me. Uh, and and uh, uh, if we look though at, at the particular SDGs, uh, those that really uh, resonate with me as, as issues, uh, things that have to do with security, uh, 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 I'll, I'll start with number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. This is, uh, there's a lot of uh, elements here that will, uh, 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 that, that can uh, come up with regulations and, and standards and, and uh, the, the, the main uh, instruments of society to have security. And, and of course, uh, decent work. Number eight says decent work and economic growth. Economic growth is something that, that uh, Phoebe talked about and, and uh, is an expert, but decent work is, is a different thing. And then I could talk about good health or gender equality and so on and so forth. These are those that really affect our sense of security. I won't go into the department of, of Pavlos, uh, uh, but our sense of security depends tremendously and intimately uh, uh, through aspects of, of this. And technology, as I said, uh, with its tremendous advances the past few years, the, the tremendous speeds in which it can compute things and the, the tremendous data it can amass and then use to compute, generate more, more data and so on and so forth, put in, gen, in danger tremendous elements of our security, our sense of security. Our privacy may be jeopardized because our, our data can be transferred uh, either maliciously or by accident or uh, even on purpose. I mean, all the young generation, you know, spills their guts in, 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 on Facebook and Instagram and, and uh, Snapchat and so on and so forth. And, and after a few years, they say, oh, I, I did this. How did you learn that? I, I wouldn't want the world to know it. And, and, but the person herself or himself had, has done this. Um, let alone the malicious things or the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the the selling of private information uh, without the proper consent and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, then, of course, th there are other aspects of security uh, where uh, uh, work is in danger because of the tremendous advancements of, of, uh, uh, of computing technology and robotics and so on and so forth. Uh, many, many words, including computing uh, computing professionals' work works are in danger 
So how can we have work security and safety? Uh, what should society do? Uh, how we can achieve uh, um, SDG number eight um, uh, uh, while facing the tremendous, innovative, exciting advances of technology that put work in danger. And, and this, uh, uh, many, many disciplines to come and think about this. Of course, not just as technologists, but definitely economists, definitely politicians, policymakers, definitely sociologists, psychologists, and anthropologists uh, uh, to come together and see how society should achieve this. And um, uh, to bring in the educational aspect, which is a, a major issue uh, of, of this um, of this meeting, uh, for, for all of these disciplines and, and, and for the communities of all these disciplines, these are uncharted territory. These are issues that we are facing, we haven't seen in the past. Yes, you know, the first industrial revolution, some jobs were lost, some jobs were lost and so on and so forth, but uh, nothing at the scale that is happening now. So also the second and third uh, industrial revolution. Now we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we have machines, you know, you use them to write, I mean, everyone has heard of the uh, uh, chat GPT that came out December 1st, and uh, you ask it to write a poem in the style of uh, Lord Byron, and it comes back with a half decent poem. I mean, it's not, Byron stuff, of course, uh, uh, but uh, it comes with half a decent thing that is reminiscent of Byron. And then you ask it to write a piece of code that will do this. And whereas the programmer would need, you know, a week or two or a month to do it, then in a few seconds, you get a program that most often it works and it does what you asked for it. So these are completely uncharted territories that are exciting I think in general, not just for me, who I'm a technologist, and, and I am part of the community that, that uh, develops these things, uh, they're exciting, I think, in general. What could we achieve if we put all this to good use? But also uh, with this danger, and us technologists cannot be just playing uh, uh, happily with, with our uh, uh, within, in our sandbox and, and uh, creating great castles because the impact to society is tremendous. And and uh, uh, humanity is, is not ready for it. So how can we uh, work on this together? Uh, educate ourselves. As technologists, we have to work with, as I said, other, other uh, disciplines and ethicists, by the way, philosophers. Uh, 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 we need to have them there to to uh, to uh, identify pathways of thought that is very uh, uncommon for us technologies and and for many other disciplines, uh, so we can find the right path and and lead uh, um, uh, society to to the right place uh, where we get the good and and we avoid the bad. Um, and uh, I talked about educating the scientists, but also society needs to be educated um, at the lowest level, uh, at the university level, but also high school. Uh, uh, students, young students, the young generation, the upcoming generation should understand the impact of technology on these issues. I mean, connecting technology with the SDGs is, is a given in my mind, and we should be doing it uh, as much as we can in whatever ways we can, but also addressing specifically the dangers of the fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, and, and what it can, uh, how it can uh, jeopardize our, our security and safety is something that we should focus uh, more. So uh, e even that prospect is, uh, is exciting and interdisciplinary work is, is exciting and, and the dance that Phoebe and I are, are dancing uh, for the, for many years now uh, is, is a proof of, of how exciting things can be. Uh, but we have to come together and, and uh, 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 explore these uncharted territories for the good of society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanis. With um, Yanis, we work on the SDSN Global Climate Hub, and our dream. 
and also Pavlos is part of, of the Climate Hub. Our dream is to create a, a digital twin of the interaction between nature and the society, socio-economy, and um, which will enable investigating and analyzing uh, ways to develop effective, efficient, and equitable pathways uh, towards climate neutrality, climate resilience, ecosystem resilience, social uh, resilience, and so on. Uh, so the, the, the vision is big. More than 50 researchers across the world are engaged in this um, vision. And we hope that more from you that are listening will also uh, integrate with us. And definitely technology and information technology is one very, very crucial aspect in all stages of the implementation of this vision from data collection, um, to uh, data gathering from satellites and institute infrastructure to analyzing data to using machine learning and AI uh, uh, to um, uh, further uh, analyze and collect and develop. So anybody who is interested can look at the site of the UN SDSN Global Climate Hub. And if you think you can engage in this work, please let us know. I'm also very happy to have Sam Loni here. Sam is also deeply engaged in the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He is program director at SDSN. And he's also a research associate at the University of Oxford. Sam is an economist, a very bright and promising young economist. I'm allowed to say that now, Sam. I can call you young. Don't, don't, me, don't take me wrong. But it's good. When you come to my age, then you will think that young is good. He has done amazing work on many different elements of um, um, economics of sustainable development. His expertise is um, uh, it, it, it's uh, deeply uh, based on uh, mathematical modeling that can um, reveal interesting ways and pathways to sustainable development. He's also passionate about education and currently leads the Global Schools Program, uh, which it's, um, it's an initiative to bring sustainability to schools around the world, a great initiative that SDSN is a part of, uh, UNESCO is part of, um, and uh, some additional institutions are part of. Uh, Sam will tell us all about it. Sam, we are excited that you are here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and uh, hear from the uh, wonderful speakers. It's hard to follow, but I will do my best and I will happily accept the uh, uh, title of uh, young. I, I have outgrown the official UN definition, most U official UN definitions, but I will uh, accept it nonetheless. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, I, I, today I would like to talk uh, briefly about sustainable development and its uh, importance um, and the role of education in, in helping accelerate sustainable development. Um, uh, when we talk about sustainable development, and, and I have heard this quite often, uh, you know, different UN meetings, um, looking through different documents from the UN, and, and uh, it's, it's a common phrase where they talk about it as a transformative agenda. Uh, whether that's direct reference to the 2030 agenda or the Paris Climate Accords uh, or any other uh, uh, related treaty or document. Um, and I think that's true uh, when you are completely shifting the uh, structure of a society, especially through the goals that have been designed, you, you are essentially talking about the societal transformation. 
But often the solutions proposed for achieving this social uh, societal transformation is um, is not one where I think it, it will necessarily achieve uh, the ambitions that we speak, the level of ambition that we're speaking about. Um, so I think actually education is a key enabler of this. So you know when we want to achieve a complete social transformation, um, education has always played a significant role, and that's because it sh shifts the baseline. Uh, it shifts the baseline in, in, in values and in skills and behaviors and enables really that long-term tr transformation to take place. It is also a very important uh, predictor of uh, social development, you know, from economic growth to uh, human development and to uh, social progress. So it is an extremely powerful tool for social transformation, which I think is what is needed for us to sh shift from a uh, fossil fuel-based and extractive system to one uh, that is um, sustainable, but also inclusive and uh, uh, actually a more egalitarian and more equal society. So it does require that that, that social transformation that, that we talk about. But I do think that at the moment, the policies are not there. And, and this is why I think education is a very important enabler. And uh, in my mind, for sustainable development, you need a different type of education. And this type of education is called uh, education for sustainable development, or in, um, uh, in terms of its acronyms ESD uh, and uh, a lot of people talk about the importance of, uh, of ESD uh, but actually in practice it's important to understand uh, what, uh, what that means. Um, ESD is essentially about giving uh, individuals and students the, the values, the skills, the attitudes to be able to shape sustainable societies and to be a, actually be able to uh, deal with complexities and the shocks uh, that may uh, arise in the future, but actually be able to um, uh, have the skills to thrive in a future economy and, and shape their societies in a way that, that will enable them to be resilient in the face of those challenges. Um, and for this, again, you need to shift that uh, baseline. Uh, and uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, where a lot of uh, policymakers talk about the long-term uh, effects of uh, education, which are where you will see the the, the 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 biggest outcomes, there are actually some immediate effects that are often uh, neglected or not measured. And that is that you see significant spillovers with one or two uh, lessons uh, focused on ESD. Uh, basically, the, the effect it has on parents, on the community, on the teachers, and uh, these uh, are starting to be very uh, they're starting to be documented in the literature, which I think is very important. And but the question is, okay, um, ESD is about social transformation. So why should ministries of education, uh, uh, ministry of, ministries of education around the world, care about this? Because the mandate of the Ministry of Education is actually to, um, uh, you know, enhance educational outcomes. Why should they care about uh, ESD? Um, that's because actually ESD is a win-win both for uh, education and for society. And what do I mean by that? Uh, there is a Stanford review um, of, uh, I think it's about 120 different studies on uh, environmental and climate education. And, and obviously it shows that it, you know, when you when you uh, implement these types of uh, this type of education, it has an effect on the social and environmental behaviors of students and the community and the parents. But actually, also shows that it improves educational outcomes. You see uh, more engagement from the students. Students ask more more questions, for instance. Uh, teacher satisfaction goes up. You actually see better attendance rates. You see better um, uh, performance in, uh, in on tests, even on, on on subjects that are not related to uh, sustainability, and a whole bunch of other uh, types of um, uh, effects that have been observed uh, through various studies uh, that have been conducted. So the Stanford review of these 120 studies reveals that ESD is is win-win education, environment, and society. But the question is, if it's win-win, why, why are we not seeing more of it? Um, there are UNESCO studies that have analyzed curricula around the world and see that it is very few, very few references to sustainable development in the curriculum or in educational policy. And in terms of implemented um, educate, um, curriculum, and actually basically how much of what is mentioned in the policy gets into the classroom 
there is even less. So we we are we have a, uh, a global cohort of primary and secondary school students who are not getting the necessary training to thrive in the 21st century. And we're not giving them the necessary training to actually be able to shape the sustainable societies that we want. And I think we have a responsibility to change that uh, as the current generation. So why are we not seeing more of this? And I think the reason is because this is a new field. Uh, the benefits until recently haven't been clear. Uh, it takes a very long time to shift um, um, uh, you know, the curriculum within countries. And it is a very contested space and everyone wants to put things into the curriculum. So it is a deeply complex area um, and change is very slow at the curriculum level. Uh, but what we have found is that there is a huge appetite around the world uh, for ESD, among, especially among teachers. And so we are using a, a model, a train the trainer model with global schools, which is uh, the, the program that uh, I founded, which is uh, really built on how do we get sustainability into classrooms and into uh, schools around the world. And the way we do that is we identify teachers, we train them online, we give them the tools and resources, and we allow them to localize ESD where it can have the greatest impact. And then we um, observe their actions and we support them as they try to get the rest of the school on board. And we have found this model to be extremely effective. And uh, we have gathered a lot of data on it, both quant uh, quantitative data as well as qualitative data, which shows that actually just by training one teacher, you can bring 20 other teachers on board. And more importantly, you can actually have a massive amplified effect down the line. So you, we, through this model, we are really planting the seeds um, by just uh, using specific teachers. And, 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 and I think the next step for us is to scale up this effort. But I do hope that ESD and um, education uh, for climate and, and uh, uh, global citizenship get uh, a, a more attention uh, within, uh, within the policy circles, because while our efforts are important, uh, it needs to be supported also by policy in order to be scaled up effective. And with that, I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, yes, we, we need to give the needed training for being able to form the sustainable societies we envision. And um, we need to upscale initiatives like the global schools that train the trainers that are in direct contact with all those that need to be educated. Uh, the um, SDSN Europe that I lead is um, engaged in an initiative that measures SDG engagement in universities across the world. We are following the guide for starting uh, uh, with SDGs in universities, but we are going a bit uh, uh, further down in terms of the analysis and we transpose research in terms of NDG content, education, operation, and external leadership. This is again in the same spirit of if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it, you cannot improve it. And I hope that this initiative will also scale up. Thank you so much for being here.